Welcome to County Road 189, the haunted stretch of road that runs right through the middle of Bearheart Nation. I am your host and co-driver, Josh Bearheart Hawk, and in this episode, we're going to be talking about monsters and how gore ruins horror. So buckle in, keep your eyes on the road, and watch out for ghostly hitchhikers. So some of my favorite movies and horror stories are based on monsters. And to me, a a good monster story has to have a few different elements. It has to have a a good creepy atmosphere. It has to have some some buildup and some tension. And it doesn't necessarily always have to reveal the monster. From what I've found in a lot of different Movies and and stories that I've read over the years, the best horror movies are the ones that hide the monster at least for the majority, and sometimes not even not even showing the monster. If you look at a movie like uh, I believe it was Cloverfield, is what it's called <laughs> from back in the day. Uh, I didn't ever watch that movie, but I, I'd heard things about it, and I'd heard people talk about how awesome the movie was until they showed the monster. And to me, that's kind of been a principle when I've been writing horror, when I've been writing different stories involving monsters, there's some of my favorite stories to to write, but I try to keep the monster to a minimum, you know, just lurking in the background. And I think that's what makes some monster stories as good as they can possibly be. Now, something that does bother me, (laughs) and this doesn't just apply to monster stories, this applies to horror in general. And horror in general, in the past, I want to say 10 or 15 years, has really started leaning heavy into gore. And this is monsters and serial killers and ghost stories, you know, all, all kinds of different movies, especially, that lean heavy into gore. And I understand that there is a certain segment of the population that likes that that kind of stuff. There are certain people out there that absolutely love it and will not, you know, they don't they don't consider it a horror movie unless it's got gratuitous gore in it. I, however, tend to go the opposite direction. I actually think that gore ruins horror movies and books and TV shows more than anything else could possibly do it. For me, if you have to have gore, you are basically giving up. You're saying, we don't have a way to scare you, so let's cut somebody's arm off. You know, they they do the craziest things. I, the, the thing that comes to mind the most when it comes to that kind of stuff is the Saul franchise. And I watched the first couple Saul movies. I really liked the first one. There was a little bit of gore in it, but it wasn't too bad. And it was really psychological, and it was really leaning heavy on a a, a real story. As those movies went on, however, and you get further into the series, they started relying more on how gruesome can we make the traps? You know, what can we do to to top ourselves from the last movie? And I feel like, the, and I don't know if it's the Saw franchise that kind of started the cycle of all of this. But I feel like it was at least heavily, (laughs) heavily weighted uh, when it comes to other movies and influencing other movies over the years, because I've seen so many horror movies coming out, especially recently, and they show the trailer and then they hint at all the gore that's going to be happening through the movie. And I'm like, I don't want to see that. To me, that's not horror. I am very, very into psychological stuff. I'm very into hide the monster like i said earlier stuff where you know something weird is going on in the background but you don't quite know what and that makes it really really creepy that's the kind of stuff that i lean into when i'm writing my horror and i understand that's not for everybody psychological horror a lot of times especially in this day and age where people are so move quick and get through get on to the next thing they don't stay focused on anything for too long it's a situation where when you have a psychological horror movie, people don't want to watch it two or three times necessarily to figure out what all the twists were, you know, they don't pay close enough attention during the movie. You know, I think a lot of people nowadays 
have gotten in the habit of almost sitting on their phones during movies. And <laughs> I've seen my wife's guilty of this and she knows it. And she'll tell you like she will, if she's really interested in a part of a movie, she'll be watching it, but she can't really pay attention to the whole movie without looking at her phone or checking things and, and still enjoy herself. You know, she gets, it's, it's a common thing. A lot of people, are that way now where they are, they want to look at their phones. They got to check their phones every five seconds and the movie's just kind of on in the background. So they wind up missing things. And when I first started writing my stories, that was one of my biggest things that I was kind of worried about. And I think I've, I've seen it in some instances, I think, but realistically YouTube statistics on the back end, they're, they're crap. They, <laughs> they don't tell you everything. They don't tell the whole story, um, but there's a lot of situations where I, I put little Easter eggs and little things in my stories that I know most people aren't catching. And some people do, and some people will pick up on them. And that I absolutely love getting the comments when people get it. But unfortunately we're, we're in a society now where people just aren't paying that close of attention. And even things like, I mean, this podcast, you might be listening in your car while you're driving. You might be listening while you're walking and, and really listening to it, or you might have it on in the background off to the side while you're playing a, a video game. You know, I'm guilty of that myself. I will put on, a, I've been into playing Valheim lately. <laughs> and so I'll sit there and I will, I'll put on Valheim and I'll start playing. And in the background on the other, on the other monitor, I'll put up a horror story or something that I want to listen to. Cause there's a couple different channels that I really enjoy. And so I can kind of understand why we've kind of gotten there, especially when it comes to audio stuff. Now, if I'm driving, if I'm in the car, if it's a really good story or podcast or whatever, I might wind up getting really wrapped up in it, which, <laughs> you know, you want to pay attention to the road, but if I'm driving down the freeway or something like that, I'm, I'm liable to kind of, I got my eyes on the road, but my mind is on whatever I'm listening to. And that keeps me going. That keeps me wound up, you know? So that's the, that's the stuff that like I'm trying to build up with my stories, that psychological element, because in, in the end, I, that's what I want is people listening to these stories that I write and listening to these podcasts and that kind of stuff and enjoying themselves in that way and being able to kind of really soak it all in and pay close attention to it, even though it can be really hard as a, as a whole today for people to do that kind of thing. So, in talking about gore and monsters and that kind of stuff, this this episode, I've got three stories that I've written over the past few months that all have to do with monsters. And they're not always necessarily obvious monsters with these stories, um, especially with the first one. The second and third ones are a little more obvious and blatant, but the first one's kind of subtle. And <laughs> I want to see if you catch it, if you get it, I was really happy with this story. This was one of those stories that when I first, I was, I was trying to, I was struggling with coming up with an idea um, this particular week. And I was like, you know, I kind of want to do something detective based, but I wasn't quite sure what. So I started just writing and I started with the detective at the crime scene and it kind of built up and I'm like, I, I, I wasn't exactly sure where I was going. My initial idea was like, well, I want to have, three or four different crime scenes and a whole thing. And that it just became, that was too much, you know, for a short story, especially when I'm trying to keep them between eight and 15 minutes long. I try to, I tend towards pulling back on some of the things that I would do if I were writing a much longer story or writing a full book. So <laughs> this first story rolling right into it, is, is called An Unwelcome Guest. And like I said, it's a detective story. At first glance, it's not necessarily a monster story, but when you really pay attention to what's being said and what's going on throughout the story and pay close attention to what the guy is talking about with the detective when it gets to that point, and I think you'll kind of start to figure out that, huh, there's something more to this. So let's go ahead and get into it. This is An Unwelcome Guest. It was warm for early May, as the detective strolled into the crime scene. He couldn't believe this was the fifth murder of the year, as he took off his fedora and looked over the body. 
Mount Vernon was a small town with less than 20,000 residents that averaged maybe one murder a year, and that was on a bad year. At a cursory glance, the victim appeared to have died from a blow to the head, just like all the others. Officers that checked the scene before the detective arrived reported nothing appeared to be missing, and there were no signs that the house had been broken into, just like all the others. At this point, even the chief would have to admit that they had a serial killer on their hands. Walking around the room, he took notes about the layout and how the body was positioned, hoping something would stick out. When he felt that he had all he needed, he signed the coroner's release form so the body could be moved and left. It was nearly dinner time and he wanted to grab a bite before heading back to the office. He stopped at his favorite diner, hopping on his usual stool and greeting the waitress with a smile. It was people like her that kept him doing this after all these years. Innocent civilians who only wanted to go about their lives, barely keeping up with the news of the latest crimes. She smiled and asked him about his day as she poured his cup, and he told her it had been a long one as he hid the truth behind his own rugged grin. Finishing his food, he left some money on the counter and made his way back to work. Walking into the station, he winced as he heard the voice of the chief. Fields, just in time. Please tell me this one was something new, he said, motioning the detective into his office. I wish I could, sir. The same as the other four. I mean the exact same. The wound was in the same spot. The room layout was the same. Nothing taken, no forced entry. It was like walking into any of the others, Detective Fields said, taking a seat across from the chief. I'm starting to think I might have been wrong then. Maybe we are dealing with one killer. We've got to keep this quiet for now. The public will panic if they find out. We can't give them anything to look out for anyway, so just fill out your report and drop it in the bin for now, the chief said as he stood up and grabbed his coat. The paper is already speculating. I'm not sure how long we can hold them off, Fields replied, furrowing his brow. If anyone asks, we're investigating all five murders, but we haven't linked them. I've got a dinner to get to. We'll talk more on Monday, he said, walking out the door. Detective Fields moved to his own office and started working on his report. The chief was a good man, but he was a little frustrating to work with at times. As the hour grew late, the detective's eyelids started to grow heavy. He hadn't been sleeping a lot lately, and it was beginning to get to him. He was about halfway through the report when he heard footsteps approaching his office. Perking up, he looked through the door, expecting to see someone walk in at any moment. The steps stopped just feet from the door, and he thought for a moment he was just hearing things. As he was about to get back to the report, he heard someone clear their throat in the hallway. <coughs> Who's there? Detective Fields asked in a tired voice. After a couple of minutes with no response, the detective stood up and walked over to the door, peering into the hallway to find there was no one there. The hair on the back of his neck went stiff as he moved further into the hall, still seeing no one. I'm losing my mind, he said to the darkness of the quiet station. Turning around to face his office, he stopped cold when his eyes landed on a person sitting in his chair. The figure was a man in his thirties, wearing a suit and looking like he hadn't spent a day in the sun ever. A gold lapel on the notch of his suit bore an odd symbol and his hair was slicked back. He wore a broad smile on his gaunt face and his eyes were those of a man with secrets. G can I help you? The detective muttered. No, but I can help you. I know about the case you've been tracking. The murders of those five innocent people. See, I know a thing or two about murder. I spent time inside the minds of those who do it. You've been looking in all the wrong places, Jimmy, the man said, the smile on his face growing with each word. Uh, I... It's Detective Fields. If you've got information, I would be glad to hear it, but how did you get in here? Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. You're focusing on the wrong thing, son. How I got in here is the least of your concerns. You should be wondering how what I know is going to help you nail the son of a bitch, the man said, his smile fading. The detective eyed the stranger, trying to gather his nerve. The presence of the man seemed to have brought a chill to the air, 
and the sound of thunder outside only added to the eerie feeling. Okay, I'll bite. What do you know about our killer? Well, of course, it can't be that easy. You're a detective, after all, so you still have to solve the clues to find the perp. The man's smile returned. Why don't you start by telling me what you know about each crime scene, and I'll fill in some details. Walking over to his desk, Detective Fields picked up a pile of folders containing the case details and opened the top file, sitting in the chair across from the man. The first victim, Tina Holbrook, was murdered in her home in the north side of town. There was no sign of force entry. The coroner said she died from blunt force impact to the back of her head. There was nothing missing from the home, according to her family, so robbery was ruled out as a motive. Nothing was missing, but was there anything that didn't belong? The man asked. There wasn't anything that stood out as not belonging, and her family would have known. Are you sure about that? The man's eyes flashed as he spoke. I suppose there could have been something that they missed, but how... Detective Field started. Were there any odd symbols? Something that seemed out of place in the home of an old woman? The man interrupted. The detective thought back to the scene, looking through the photos in the file. One of the photos stood out to him now. One that included the coffee table the woman was lying next to. On it, there was a deck of cards scattered around with the numbers facing up. They all looked normal, except for one that had a black and white tree on it instead of a suit. The playing cards were a little weird to see, but they didn't really stand out at the time. We assumed she was just playing solitaire. Ah, but now you're starting to see it, the man grinned, nearly falling out of his chair as he celebrated. Looking at the second file, Detective Fields found the same symbol on the bottom of a coffee cup that had been tipped on its side. The third file showed the symbol in the center of the coffee table itself etched into the wood, and the fourth had it shown on a doily in the center of the table. We don't have photos from the most recent scene yet, but I do remember seeing the same symbol on some stationery sitting on a table. I thought it was a company logo of some kind, Detective Fields said, now even more curious about the man's origins. It's much older than any company, and death seems to follow it around. It goes back to at least ancient Rome, though it could be a lot older. Can you think of anywhere else you've seen it? The man was now leaning forward in the chair, his hands clasped, his elbows on the desk. Looking around the room, Detective Fields tried to remember seeing anything like the symbol anywhere else. It looked familiar, yet he couldn't place it. Looking back at the man, he realized where he had seen it. Your lapel. You're wearing the symbol. You're sharper than you look, detective. But can you put all the pieces together? The man said, somehow moving from the chair to standing next to Detective Fields in the blink of an eye. It's a calling card. You left a calling card and no one even noticed. The detective was now frozen in place, unable to react to the man now towering over him. Right you are, Jimmy. I wish I had a prize to give you but I guess some explanation will do before, well, you know what has to happen. See, I discovered the symbol of Eretite decades ago. It was a funny little thing stamped on a card next to my mother's body. I chased it for years, hoping to catch her killer, only to find out it was a curse. You see, the one who wears the mark must pay penance for those that came before. Blood is the only acceptable currency, and only those who are unwilling can pay. At first, I refused the urge. I battled the demon for years before finally giving in to its will. But my time is up. Someone new needs to take it on so I can accept my blessing. Don't worry, detective. Think of it as a chance to see what the other side goes through. You'll be much better at catching killers well, you are one. The man was now sitting inches from Detective Field's face. Unable to respond, the detective watched in horror as the man removed the lapel and pinned it to his suit. A warm feeling washed over him as the man smiled and disappeared. His arms and legs regained their ability to move, 
and he reached for the pen, desperate to remove it. As his hands touched the cool metal, he hesitated. Why fight it? Hadn't the man said it was useless to resist? With a renewed feeling of calm, Detective Field stood up and walked to the door, grabbing his hat off the rack and shutting off the light. A smile crept across his face as he thought about what he was going to tell the chief on Monday morning. Okay, so like I said, <laughs> that one, it, it takes a, a kind of crazy twist there at the end. The idea of it being a monster story, when I, when I finished writing it and I got done with it and I started really looking at it, I'm like, you know, this makes a lot of sense especially with the symbology going way back. It's some kind of a creature that is using this symbol as kind of a way to pass itself along. Um, I, I didn't go much deeper than that. You know, it's not one of those where I build a ton of lore up in my mind around it. It was just something where I was like, you know, this is this, the symbol helps to kind of turn people into monsters. And so that's kind of where I went with it. And it was it was a good example of one of those stories that's kind of open ended because it could be a monster, it could also be a spirit or a demon of some kind, or maybe you know an ancient god or goddess. You know, there's any number of things that it could technically be, but you know, in my mind, the way I was thinking of it was kind of like a monster. But not all monsters are quite that subtle. <laughs> And the next couple of stories are very blatant monster stories. You can tell that they're, you know, the monsters are make an appearance in the stories, but they're also kind of both inspired by a similar kind of thing. So a few years ago, I um, had a buddy that we're still good friends, but he had just started working at the same place that I was working at. We'd only been, we'd only known each other for a little bit. And he introduced me to uh, this hobby that he had recently picked up called geocaching. And at first I was like, this is kind of weird. I'd ne never heard of it before. Uh, geocaching, if, if you aren't familiar, it's basically a, a worldwide game where you get the coordinates of a container, a, a cache, Somewhere out in the wild, somewhere out in, it could be in a city somewhere, it could be hidden, any number of places. I mean, you have you have driven by and seen a place where a geocache is hidden at some point, whether you realize it or not. And so you, you go to the location where it's supposed to be, and then you kind of search around and you find the hidden container, take it out, sign the log, put it back. And then there's a there's an app for it. You can go on, you can go on the website, you can go on the app, and you can fill out that you found it. And let the, the person who placed the cash know that somebody was out there and found their cash. So it's kind of a fun game. When I first heard about it, I was like, this is, uh, <laughs> I don't know about all this. But he took me to what is one of the oldest geocaches in Ohio as my very first geocache. And we went out, we went hiking, and it was probably, uh, I don't know, a mile or two hike through this real easy trail. It was a real level. It wasn't too hard to get to. And then it was just kind of searching around until we finally found the container. And it was a big ammo can with a bunch of stuff inside it. And I was like, oh, this is this actually is kind of cool. But I didn't really get into it until a little bit later. We went out and it was more of a thing that we could just kind of hang out and do together, you know? And so for this first story, <laughs> the 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 I this was inspiring this was inspired by the idea when we were out geocaching where I was like, you know, it would be kind of interesting if we could, if we found like a building or some kind of abandoned place out here, because I, I used to really like to watch the urban explore urban exploration videos on YouTube. I used to like to do some urban exploration myself, though I didn't do a whole lot, but that, that kind of stuff always intrigued me. And I thought, how cool would it be to find something that like nobody else had found out in the middle of the woods. And so when I started kind of coming up with the story, that was kind of the train of thought that I was going down. And I thought, okay, this is going to be a lot of fun. So let's go ahead and write this and see what happens. And when it came out and I got to the end of it and it was funny because he, my buddy, he's read, <laughs> read or listened to both of these stories. And he, he very heavily sees the influence where he's involved in, in 
both times because it involves geocaching and two people. And he's like, man, I'm always the one getting killed off in these stories. What's up with that? <laughs> and I'm like, that's not intentional. I'm not trying to kill you off. It just kind of happens that way. So <laughs> we'll go ahead and get started with the first one here. And then after it's over, we'll talk a little bit about it. And then we'll roll into the next one. So the first one is called The Lab in the Woods. So let's take a listen to that story now. Mike pulled up to Dylan's house at a little after three in the afternoon, horn blurring and radio blasting country music. The first weekend in June had been their guys weekend since they were juniors in high school. And even though both men settled down and started families, they still held the time as sacred. They took turns picking out an activity each year, with Dylan usually opting for things like a weekend in Vegas or a trip to Atlantic City when it was his turn. This year, Mike got to pick, meaning some kind of outdoor excursion. He usually picked a camping trip, sometimes involving hunting or fishing, and sometimes testing their endurance through a grueling hike. As much as Dylan pretended to hate Mike's trips, Mike knew that deep down his friend loved the outdoors as much as he did. Dylan strolled out of the garage, wheeling his mountain bike along as he waved and smiled. Mike turned down the music and smiled back. You ready for this wild weekend? He asked, his smile widening. I want to say yes, but after those rapids last year, I don't want to put my foot in my mouth, Dylan replied. It'll be fun. Besides, how much trouble could we possibly get into with our bikes? I'll withhold judgment until I see the plan. I've just got a couple of things to grab and I'll be out, Dylan said, loading his bike onto the rack on the back of the SUV and turning to go back inside. 20 minutes later, the two were pulling out onto the main road and heading for the highway. The wind was whipping through the open windows and they were catching up on life. As they pulled onto the interstate, the conversation turned to Mike's plans for the pair. All right, so what exactly am I getting into this weekend? Dylan asked, looking at the map Mike had pulled out of the glove box. There's this awesome spot in the Hawking Hills that no one knows about, with a mountain bike trail that leads up to the peak of one of the tallest spots in Southern Ohio. I found out about it on one of the hiking forums I'm on, and the pictures that people were sharing from the peak look amazing, Mike explained. So, no one knows about it, except for the people on the internet that shared pictures of it, Dylan said, narrowing his eyes as he looked at Mike. It's a private forum. Only a few people use it or even know about it. I'm telling you, it's going to be worth the trip. One day to ride up, one day to ride back down. If it isn't the coolest place you've seen, I'll let you pick the trips for the next four years. Oh, I like that deal. You're on, Dylan said. The drive took about three hours, with the duo arriving at the parking area just after seven. The sun was still high enough in the sky that they were able to set up a small camp for the night and make some dinner. As it started to get dark, they each settled into their own tents to get some rest before the real adventure began. The sun hadn't even crested the horizon the next morning as the pair packed up their camp and loaded their bikes for the day. After a final check of tire pressure, they started on the trail. The first few miles went fairly quick, and by lunchtime, they had covered more ground than they had expected. They stopped at a shelter just off the trail, eating as they discussed some of the wildlife they had spotted along the way. It was just after noon when they started riding again, and the heat of the day was starting to set in. By late afternoon, they had hit the toughest part of the trek. The trail had become an uphill climb and both men were struggling to keep their bikes moving. Even with the difficulty, they were able to reach the summit by early evening, setting up camp before hiking the short trail to the observation point at the top of the mountain. Damn, I guess I owe you an apology for the earlier doubt, Dylan said, his eyes wide. I told you it was beautiful. Was it worth the ride? Absolutely. I take back all the terrible things I was going to say. It's almost worth letting you pick the trip next year, too, Dylan grinned. I said almost. After taking some photos for social media, the two hiked back down to their camp and settled in for the night. They were both extremely sore, but they knew the ride back down the next day would be a lot easier than the ride up had been. The sound of crickets and owls filled the air as the stars began overtaking the night sky. 
They sat up for a couple of hours after sunset to soak in the beauty of the universe before them. When the mosquitoes became too much to deal with, they said goodnight and climbed into their tents. Sunrise saw the men packing up and hopping back on their bikes for the descent. Dylan led the way as they coasted down the slope, though he seemed to be having some trouble with the turns on the incline. Mike was about to ride up and asked Dylan if he would prefer to walk this part of the trail when Dylan missed a corner and shot off into the forest. Slamming on his own brake, Mike came to a stop just at the point where Dylan had disappeared. He couldn't see anything below, and the drop looked to be at least 20 feet. Dylan! Dylan, can you hear me? Mike shouted as loud as he could. For what felt like an eternity, the forest seemed to be completely quiet. There were no birds, no bugs, no sounds at all. Then, a yell caused Mike's heart to skip a beat. I'm okay. I landed in a bush and have some small cuts, but I don't think anything's broken, Dylan responded. Grabbing a rope and medical kit from his bag, Mike made his way down to help his friend. It had been years since he had last repelled, but his knot was solid enough to hold him as he walked down the steep hill. Reaching the bottom, he turned around to see Dylan sitting on a rock, holding his leg and staring at his bike, which was bent in several ways it was not supposed to be. This might be Stacy's last ride, Dylan said. Good, maybe you can pick out a better name for the next one, Mike replied, walking over to get a better look. I might need a few minutes before I try climbing out. My knee might be a little worse off than I realized. There was something hard under the bush, and I heard a crack when I landed. What happened? It looked like you just missed the turn, Mike said as he walked toward the bush. My brakes gave out. Line must have been loose or something. Mike was staring intently into the bush, oblivious to what Dylan had said. He had spotted something that seemed off behind the thick leaves and was trying to get a closer look. As he moved some of the branches aside, he could see what looked to be some kind of old door. Mike, what are you doing? I think I see something in here. It looks like a door? As Mike cleared away more brush, Dylan stood up and hobbled over to him. Working together, the men revealed a door that looked like a basement door on the side of one of their houses. A lock held it shut, but Mike made quick work of that with a nearby rock before Dylan could protest. Why would you do that? Anything could be down there, and given the location, I'm willing to bet it has something to do with a drug operation, Dylan said. Well, too late now. Besides, I doubt anyone still uses the place. Didn't you see the rust? Mike said, reaching down and pulling on the handle on the right. As the door swung open, the smell of mildew poured from the opening. It was clear this place was old and most likely unoccupied. Glancing over and smiling at Dylan, Mike put his foot on the top concrete step and began to make his way down. You coming? A quick look can't hurt. Fine, but go slow. My knee's still aching. As they reached the bottom of the stairs, they both pulled out their phones and turned on the flashlights. They were in a tunnel with spider webs and mold all around them. Making their way along the passage, they soon came to another door. This one looked much thicker, being made of metal and resembling something from a fallout shelter. A round handle in the center of it looked rusted, but it turned much easier than Mike anticipated. Looking over at Dylan to make sure they were both on the same page, Mike pushed the door with all his might and found that it actually opened. A light from the other side of the door filled the tunnel, stunning both men. Walking out of the small space, they found themselves in what looked like some kind of hospital hallway. The floor appeared freshly waxed, and the air smelled of cleaning supplies. Tell me the truth, Mike. I died when I went over that cliff, and you're just a figment created by my brain to deal with it, right? Sorry, bud, but unless we both died when you wrecked, this is all real, Mike replied. Where the hell are we? Dylan asked as they started meandering down the hall. No idea, but I'm a little worried about where everyone else is. Why would a place this clean be this empty? As they wandered, they walked past several rooms that appeared to be just as empty as the hallway. Being careful to remember the turns they were making, they followed the path until it opened up into something that looked to be a reception area. There was a desk where a receptionist would normally sit, but there was no sign that anyone else was in the building. Looking around behind the desk, Mike found some paperwork laid out into neat piles. 
Dude, check this out, Mike said. They must have been doing some kind of experiment. Time and duration of exposure, length of limbs, survival time. I'm not sure I want to know exactly what they were doing. Dylan walked up to the counter and Mike handed him one of the forms. As he examined it, he felt more and more uneasy. Something's off. We should just leave and pretend we were never here, he said, looking at Mike after reading over the strange document. Before they could start back to the exit, though, a noise from down one of the hallways caught their attention. It sounded like something was pounding on a door. After a quick glance to be sure he wasn't going alone, Dylan started creeping down the hallway. The pounding grew louder as he approached a door marked C-38 on the left side of the corridor. Looking back to be sure Mike was still with him, he reached out and grasped the handle and turned. The pounding stopped as the latch released and the door creaked open. It was only open about halfway when he felt something on the other side stopping it from going further. Looking back at Mike, Dylan was surprised to see a look of horror on his friend's face. His eyes were locked on Dylan's legs and his mouth was hanging open as if he were silently screaming. A sharp pain in Dylan's right leg caused him to jump back from the doorway just as some kind of large snake came out of the room. It looked up and down the hallway as if it expected to see something before turning and going back into the room and shutting the door. Mike and Dylan turned in unison to run back down the hall and put as much distance between themselves and the room as possible. As they moved, more pounding could be heard from more rooms. Reaching the reception area, Dylan collapsed on the floor as the pain in his legs started to become overwhelming. Mike tried to help him up, but he couldn't move. I think that thing bit me. My leg feels like it's on fire and I can't move it. You gotta try. We need to get out of here, Mike said. I don't think that's gonna happen. It's some kind of poison. It's spreading up my leg. You're gonna have to leave me here and bring help back. The color in his face was draining as he spoke. Mike pulled out the medical kit and began looking through it for anything that could help. Seeing a tourniquet, his heart leapt. If nothing else, he could slow the spread of the poison. Wrapping the device around Dylan's leg, Mike began to tighten it as his friend lost consciousness. Checking for a pulse, he found Dylan was still alive, though barely. Knowing he needed to get out and get help, Mike stood up and turned to leave as the sound of a door down the hall opening echoed through the area. Glancing toward the noise, the scene was one out of a nightmare. A creature unlike anything Mike had ever seen crawled from the room. It was standing on four snake-like appendages with a body that resembled an alligator and the head of a man. It sniffed around the hallway, oblivious to Mike and Dylan's presence only 20 feet away. Mike couldn't take his eyes off the creature until he heard Dylan make a noise. Looking back at his friend, Mike was horrified to see Dylan looking back at him with bloodshot eyes and a grin. His arms were growing dark and had a leathery appearance, very like the creature down the hall that was now making its way toward the men. Knowing he only had moments, Mike began running back toward the exit as fast as he could. He could hear the creature behind him, though he couldn't tell how far away it was. Rounding a corner, he could see the vault door only 30 feet away and sprinted with every ounce of strength he had to reach it. Bursting through the door, he turned and pulled as hard as he could. Just before it closed, he felt a sting in his leg that he assumed was his muscles screaming for oxygen. With the door closed, he sprinted the length of the dark hallway and back up the stairs into the forest before collapsing on the rock that Dylan had been sitting on only an hour prior. As he caught his breath and prepared to make his way out to get help, he began to feel an unmistakable burning sensation in his leg. Okay, so you can kind of see <laughs> where he might come off with the why am I always getting killed in these stories. The, the, the concept and the idea behind that one when I got to the end of it, um, if it wasn't obvious, the, the second person gets out and he's got bit or scratched by this thing. And basically the idea in my, in my mind was that these things are kind of been trapped down here. That was an experiment that kind of went wrong and the scientists were able to get out and trap everything in there. Right. And they just assumed eventually it'll just die off. We'll just leave it. And then these two guys stumble upon it, wind up getting inside and now one of them's out. So the terror there in my mind is this. Now we're going to have like this thing getting out and, and, just infecting all of society. It could be crazy. There, there's so many ways that that story could go 
way wrong. <laughs> but it, it was something that I thought was kind of, I, I liked the, the, the concept there at the end. The, the next story kind of goes off of the same thing as far as the geocaching thing, uh, going out into the woods, going out. And, and while that one, you know, a lab in the woods didn't really, it wasn't about geocaching per se. It was just the concept of being out in the woods. This one is directly about geocaching and it, it was inspired directly by a couple of different geocaches that we went out and got. So there is a type of cache called a night cache. And it's something that's meant as the name implies to be found at night. Now, our, the very first one that we did, he actually proposed to me, that we should go out and check out this cache and told me about it. And <laughs> the beginning of this story is, is very kind of close to the actual conversation in a way it, it's, it's very heavily changed, but it, the, the same concept of like, he came to me, he's like, Hey, I found this cache It's a night cache. It looks kind of cool. And explain the concept to me. I, I wasn't sure about it at first. And I'm like, well, okay, we'll go check it out. We'll try it. That night cache was so exciting. It was exhilarating because if you're not somebody who spends a lot of time in the woods at night, when you go out there, it's just, it's crazy. You can't see anything around you. Obviously it's nighttime um, outside of the flashlights and you've got the, the, the sounds of the woods at night and it's just, it's a whole different atmosphere and it's, it's exciting. It's invigorating. And so that was a lot of fun. Well, then we, we, we tried to follow it up and we tried to find some other caches for nighttime caches that would match that. And nothing really came close to it. You know, it's the, <laughs> the same concept, I guess, of like first love. And then, you know, the first time you do something, it's, it's the exciting, the excitement of it, the adrenaline of it. And then you, you, you spend the rest of your life chasing that high. And we've done several other night caches since then. The, one that kind of the other one that kind of fed into the story and inspired the story was actually one. Um, it's up in North Columbus, North Northeast Columbus called Harry monkey nightmare. <laughs> it's a crazy name. Uh, but we wound up doing that one twice because the first time we went out, it turned out that the, the, the tax, they, they put these uh, reflective tax up in the trees and you're supposed to use your flashlight and follow the reflective tax to the woods. And, we got to a point where we just ran out of tax. And the funny thing about that night was that at one point we stopped because we thought we saw some tax off in the, uh, off in the distance across this field we were standing at. And all of a sudden some of those tax started moving. And then we realized it was a group of coyotes. <laughs> and of course he's freaking out. Cause he's like, I don't want to get eaten tonight. We need to get out of here. I'm like, Oh, it's fine. They're just coyotes. It's not that big of a deal, <laughs> but so we were standing there and we finally decided to leave. And what sucked was, so normally these night caches, especially you go into the woods, you follow the tax. You, by the time you get to the actual area where the cache container is at, you usually have gone in a loop and you're back close to the parking area. So it's a pretty straight shot out. Well, we weren't anywhere near the final. So we wound up actually having to go out onto the road and walk several miles around this road back to where the car was parked because we weren't going to walk back through the woods we just came through. It was a mess going through there. It was a pain, uh, especially because it was cold and wet, and it was just, it was a mess. So we went ahead and walked back around, and then we went back out once the cash owner had actually fixed it, and we were able to finally claim it. And that that was actually a lot of fun when we finally got there, and especially because when we got to the back half of it, and we were getting close to where the final was, and we heard some noises off in the woods, and we looked over, and we could see some people off in the distance with flashlights doing the same thing we were doing, <laughs> but they were just way behind us. I was like, well, that's kind of cool. So that, it was, it was something that I, I can't overstate how much fun it is to go out in the woods at night to get a geocache, <laughs> but always do it with friends. Never go out in the woods at night by yourself. Uh, that's uh, just a rule to live by. <laughs> and it might've actually, I, uh, it wouldn't have helped the people in our story, but it it's still a good thing to do. 
So without further ado, with all of that out of the way now, we'll go ahead and jump in the story. And then when we get done with it, we'll talk a little bit about it like we've been doing. So this story is called Why I Won't Go Geocaching at Night Ever Again. My friend Andrew and I have known each other for years. We met at work when he started with a company that I had been with for over a year and became fast friends. Over time, we started hanging out a lot, camping and fishing and talking about philosophy and religion, our two favorite subjects to debate. About a year and a half ago, he discovered a new hobby, geocaching. At first, I was a little annoyed at his excitement for what he called caching, but soon I began to enjoy it right along with him. After a couple of months, we had both become pretty good at finding the hidden stashes and were looking for a challenge. One day in early October, I was sitting at my desk working on a report when Andrew walked up to me with a sly grin. Hey buddy. He seemed to be trying to contain a level of excitement that I had not seen in him before. What's up? I asked slowly, knowing he only had that look when a crazy idea had found its way into his head. I found a cache I think we should do this weekend. There is a small catch, though, he said. Well, now you have my attention. So, there's a type of cache that's meant to be found at night. This one in particular is in a forest about 70 miles from here. You have to use a flashlight to follow a series of reflectors to the final location where the cache is hidden. By this point, I was both skeptical and excited. I had never been one to go trudging through the woods in the middle of the night, especially in a place where I had never been. This cache, however, sounded like a lot of fun. When do you want to go? I asked. I was thinking maybe this weekend. My wife's sister's in town and I need to get out of the house, he replied. I'm game, I said. I could use a night out too, and it sounds like this will be an adventure for the ages. The rest of the week was spent planning and preparing for the trip. Flashlights were checked, bags were packed with water and medical supplies. We always overpacked, even for normal hiking excursions, just in case. We left Saturday afternoon, and after about a two-hour drive, we found ourselves in a small parking lot at the edge of a forest. The sun had just gone down and twilight was starting to set in. The air was crisp and cool, but still warm for October. After some final checks of our gear, we put on our packs and set out on the trail. Based on our assessment and prior logs from people who had found the cache, we figured it would be about two hours round trip. Had we known what the night would hold, we would have gotten back in the car and left. We had been following the reflective tacks used to mark the right trail on the trees for about 30 minutes. They had been set up in a simple order. A single tack on one tree and two on the next, back to a single and so on like that. I was following Andrew, since he had the brighter light of the two of us, when suddenly he stopped dead in his tracks. Jeremy, he said, his voice sounding more shaky than I expected. Yeah, buddy, what's up? The last tacks we saw were a set, right? He asked, keeping his lights on the tree in the distance. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they were. Why? I was starting to worry, though I also assumed he was trying to play a prank on me as he made a pastime out of messing with me. I'm not sure, but I think I see another set up there. I walked up next to him to see what he was seeing. Sure enough, there appeared to be two tacks about 50 feet ahead of us, 10 feet or so up in a tree. That's odd. Maybe we missed a single one somewhere, I said even though we were both sure we would have seen it. The tacks had been spaced evenly to this point and in the same order from the beginning. We decided to backtrack and make sure we hadn't missed anything. After about 15 minutes, we found our way back to the previous set and we saw that there were in fact two, and we hadn't missed any singles along the way. After a brief discussion, we decided to push on and figured that the cash owner must have just missed something during setup or maybe one had fallen out of the tree where it was supposed to be. We walked back down the trail toward the set of tacks where we had stopped at, ready to just move on and forget about it. When we got to the spot where we had stopped before, we were shocked to see that the set of tacks was now missing. 
Where did they go? He asked, his voice crackling. Maybe we just got off the trail or something. I was trying to sound convincing, but I knew my voice wasn't showing much confidence. Jeremy, there's only one trail. There's literally no other trail we could have branched off on. See that tree right there? He pointed his light at an oddly shaped tree. That is the exact tree that we saw the last time we were in this spot. I knew he was right. The tree stuck out like a sore thumb, and I remembered it very well. At this point, we were both uneasy. I know it sounds a bit dumb, but neither of us were accustomed to being in the woods at night. We lived in a big city with lights everywhere, so the darkness was unsettling, to say the least. I'm going to go a little ways further and see if there are any other tacks. If not, maybe we should just head back to the car and call tonight, I said as bravely as I could. After all, I figured, the biggest animal out here was a coyote, so there wasn't really anything to be too worried about. All right, you do that. I'm going to step over here and answer nature's call real quick. Just shout if you find anything. With that, I set off down the trail, not wanting to stick around for the details. I'd only gone about 20 feet or so, just enough to see a little bit around the upcoming bend, when my eye caught a glimmer of light. A reflector. This was a single reflector, only a few feet away from where we had thought we had seen the set earlier. I walked a little further to be sure it was a single one, and then turned around and shouted out to Andrew to let him know I'd found it. Hey Andrew, I found a tack! I shouted. No answer. I waited a couple of minutes and shouted again. But again, I was met with silence. I went back to where we'd been and began searching both sides of the trail, thinking maybe he had fallen or was somehow incapacitated and unable to respond to my calls. After a few minutes of searching, to no avail, I remembered that he and I had shared our locations on our phones with each other in case of emergency. I pulled my phone out and opened up the map app. Service was slow, but it was there. After a couple of minutes of loading, I was looking at his location on my phone, and confusion quickly set in. The location data seemed to say his phone had last pinged 30 seconds prior, over a mile away. It had to be a glitch. There was no way he traveled a mile in less than three minutes in the woods at night. I decided to try and call and see if I could hear his ringer, sure that the GPS was glitching out. As soon as I heard the ringing on my end, I turned the volume down and listened for his ringtone. There was nothing but silence. At this point, I realized I was in the middle of the woods, alone, in the dark. The next logical thing to do was follow the last reported signal of his phone and see where it led me. I reopened the map app, only to find that his signal was now showing him a half mile away in the opposite direction. It's impossible, I said to myself jumping at the sound of my own voice. Keeping the app open, I decided to start heading toward his location, keeping a close eye on the map. After about 15 minutes, I reached the location and began searching for him or his phone. Looking around and seeing nothing but darkness, I decided that the best thing to do would be to head back to the trail and call the authorities to start a search. I was out of options, and my cell coverage was almost non-existent. Suddenly, something hard hit me on the forehead. It took me a minute to realize what had happened and get my bearings. My head was pounding and with my hand I could feel a bump and a slight trickle of blood. Once I snapped back to my senses, I used my flashlight to look around and within a second I saw what had hit me. Andrew's phone was lying on the ground a couple of feet away. I picked it up and found the screen was cracked, but it was still on and the camera was recording a video. I hit the stop button, and the thought hit me that he must be trying to mess with me. Ha ha, you got me. That was a good one. Time to come out now, though, so we can get out of here. I expected to see him come out from behind a tree, laughing and gloating at his practical joke, but I received no response. I decided to play him at his own game. I'm going to start browsing through your pictures. Maybe even put those pictures you have of that night we went to Vegas on Facebook. Still nothing. I opened the photo app and began scrolling through his photos. He told me about some pictures that he had that I knew he wouldn't want getting out, 
and I figured if he saw me actually going through them, he would come out and give up. The first thing in his album was a video, the one the phone had been capturing when it hit me in the head. I hit play, figuring I would catch him throwing it at me, but what I saw was something that shook me to the core. The video started with Andrew whispering about how he was going to get me good. He switched the camera around to show me off in the distance, the light from my flashlight barely visible. I was not ready for what I saw when he switched the camera back around to his face. The light from his flashlight was lighting him up, but it was also showing something standing behind him. Before I knew what was happening, the thing grabbed him and the camera turned around, the ground approaching quickly, before complete darkness took over. In the video, I could hear noises, but I couldn't make out exactly what the noises were. A sudden fear engulfed me, and I felt like I was in immediate danger. I began running back toward the trail, dropping the phone as I went. As soon as I found the path, I followed it as fast as I could all the way back to the parking area. Once inside the car, I called 911. I must have sounded like a crazy person to the operator, telling her that the monster had taken my friend out in the woods. The police arrived within 45 minutes, giving me plenty of time to worry that it would be coming for me next. I explained to the officer why I was there and what had happened. He kept asking me about the blood on my clothes and I kept insisting we needed to get the search party out there with the biggest guns that they could muster to find the monster that had taken my friend. At first light, they had a group searching, and it wasn't long before they found the body. It appeared Andrew had been stabbed multiple times, and his phone was nowhere to be found. I was taken from the area in the back of a police car, under arrest for murder. No one believes my story, but they do agree that a monster killed my friend. All right, so that one <laughs> was a lot of fun for a couple of different reasons. Now, when I originally wrote that story, it was years ago. I was really getting into creepy pasta, and I was like, I'm going to try my hand at one of these. So I went on to Reddit on the No Sleep subreddit, and I actually posted this story. Now, the story you just heard is an updated, revised version of the original because the original, the writing was not great <laughs> i've improved a lot in the past few years with the writing uh, but th there's a lot of, there's a few things i want to change especially the ending because the original ending to that story actually involved it was, it was a different line and it was basically saying you know yeah I, I i didn't kill my friend i promise like and i didn't like that ending so i i, I think the new ending is better just because you know it, it it implies that like well i'm the monster that killed my friend even though we know as an audience and as, as readers and listeners that there's actually something that was out there, you know? So <laughs> it was, it was, it was having fun with that little twist. And I liked that ending a lot better uh, just overall for the story. And it was funny because I sent him that story. That was the first one he ever read that I've written. And he goes, why did you kill me? <laughs> and then he was like, should I go geocaching with you again? He was almost hesitant to go anywhere with me for a while. But I finally was like, look, I'm not really going to kill you. I'm just killing you in my story. There's a difference. But that was that was the, the fun of writing these kind of stories for me is, is coming up with this kind of stuff. And, you know, I tried to come up with new monsters. I try to come up with things that are kind of original. And, and the part of that's I don't go overly into description most of the time. Obviously, the lab in the woods, I, I give a nice little description of the monster. But I try not to go too over the top with it because I want people to kind of use their imagination as well. But at the same time, like with the lab in the woods, I wanted to create my own monster and I don't want to use, I feel almost like it's, it's, it's lazy writing to use a monster that other people that already exists. You know, I've read or listened to so many stories that have to do with, you know, Slender Man or Bigfoot or, you know, monsters that are already out there that people are just like, well, I want to write a monster story, but I don't want to come up. I don't want to do any of the work. I'm just going to come up with, I'll, I'll use this monster that already exists. And to me, that's, it's, it's lazy writing. I don't like it. I would prefer personally to come up with my own monsters. And so that's what I do. 
And I feel like I do an okay job at it. I'm not the greatest monster creator in the world. I never claim to be, but I still, I have fun with it. And I think that they're unique. They're things that you're not going to find anywhere else, which is kind of the point. So with all that being said, <laughs> this is the, the, this episode in particular, I was looking forward to specifically for the geocaching stuff. The, the next couple of episodes, I've got a few different things that I've been thinking about. Some things I want to share. Um, after filming, after doing the first episode and then doing this episode, I'm kind of starting to get a feeling for what exactly I want to do and how I want to do it. It's going to take some time, but you know, I, I appreciate all of you all that are here along with me for the ride. This is a brand new format for me. I, I enjoy, I love talking. I love <laughs> making videos and I, I sit here with a microphone and just ramble on for whatever amount of time, listen to stories, have a good time with y'all. I got excited because I listened to the first one in the car because I was curious, like, how's this going to sound when I'm driving around? And I'm like, oh my God, this, it reminded me of times where I've been driving late at night and listening to other people's podcasts. And I'm like, well, this is cool. My own podcast <laughs> for driving around with it's, it's something that I'm looking forward to seeing where this goes. And, and eventually, you know, uh, my ultimate goal and where I'm aiming these is to where you could drive around in the evening, late at night, whatever, uh, out doing whatever, going, maybe going back and forth to work. Maybe just out ghost hunting yourself, listening to these stories, listening to, you know, I want to go along with you for your ride. And if I can do that and if I can keep you company and entertain you along the way, Hey, that's always the goal. So I want to thank everybody for watching or listening. I guess <laughs> I'm still used to YouTube stuff. I want to thank everybody for listening. I appreciate all of you. Uh, if you liked it, like the you know hit the like button. There's always likes and follows and subscribes and all that kind of stuff that's available on different platforms. Right now, I'm only on YouTube, obviously, but we'll see what happens in the future. Uh, next one, I'm, I'm not going to give anything away just yet, but I've got a couple of really good stories for the next one. So make sure you are subscribed so you don't miss that one. And have a great rest of your night. And I will see you all in the next one. <laughs>